Welcome, everyone. It's a great privilege to open this future lecture series. My name is Andreas Röpstorff. I'm a professor at the Section for Anthropology and the Institute of Clinical Medicine here at Aarhus University. And the future lecture series is a child of the Institute of Culture and Society. We basically try to bring the smartest, the most visionary, the most radical thinkers of contemporary society and humanities to Aarhus at Aarhus University to tell us about what we could do to understand the world that we live in and the world that we might be living in. And Karen Barat is a very obvious person to have exactly under that, <clears throat> under that label. So she is currently a professor of feminist studies, philosophy and history of consciousness at the University of California in Santa Cruz. But it's really difficult to say what she is, and it might maybe be easier to say what she is not. And to introduce that, I would like to start with a small story of cosmology. It's a story usually told by white men, about white men and for white men. Stephen Hawkins has ascribed it to Bertrand Russell's. The version I have come from someone called Russ, who says it was really William James that experienced it. And the story goes that William James in 1880-something gave a lecture on cosmology, you know, cosmology and the sense of the structure of the solar system. And after the talk, he was accosted by a little old lady. This little old lady said, your theory that the sun is the center of the solar system and that the earth is a ball which rotates around it has a very convincing ring to it, Mr. James, but it is wrong. I've got a better theory, said the little old lady, and what is that, madam, inquired James politely, that we live on a crust of earth which is on the back of a giant turtle. Not wishing to demolish this absurd little theory by bringing to bear the masses of scientific evidence he had at his command, James decided to gently dissuade his opponent by making her see some of the inadequacies of position. So if your theory is, is correct, madam, what does the turtle stand on? You are a very clever man, Mr. James, and that's a very good question, replied the little old lady. But I have an answer to it, and it is this. The first turtle stands on the back of a second, far larger turtle, who stands directly under him. But what does this second turtle stand on, persisted James patiently. To this, the little old lady cried triumphantly, it's no use, Mr. James, it's turtles all the way down. Now, usually this story is ascribed to a version of Indian cosmology. But it is not true. It is a story that white men tell about two white men, maybe about old women. Because the Indian version of it seems a bit more complicated. We have a version from sometimes around 1605. A Jesuit priest writes from India in 1599 that others hold that the earth has nine corners by which the heavens are supported. Another disagreeing from these would have the earth supported by seven elephants, and the elephants do not sink down because their feet are fixed on a tortoise. But when asked who would fix the body of the tortoise so that it would not collapse, he said that he did not know. So to the Indians, they have no answer. Now, I don't know if Karen Barad will give her answer, but it's certainly not turtles all the way down. If anything, what characterizes her is really a deep interest in that the more you go down into the molecular levels, the atomic levels, the subatomic levels, what you get is not turtles, but something way more complicated. And it's a very kind of interesting exploration of what would it mean to take that way of thinking seriously and, so to say, transport it back up again. She did her PhD in physics from Stony Brook University in 1984, writing on the minimal lattice theory of fermions, quenched fermions on the Columbia lattice parallel processor, or in an article together with Ergovy and Rebbe called Quark, Anti-Quark Charge Distribution and Confinement, he suggested a simulation method for the direct analysis of the relative distribution of quarks inside a hadron. Now, I don't exactly know what this entails, but basically fermions and hadrons, they are kind of generalized categories that include the most basic particles like electrons, protons, and to some degree quarks, but not only these things that we know from the physics of high school, but also all of the even stranger composites and cosines that make these things up. So already at this time, you can say there was a deep interest in understanding both these very basic things here, both as we know them, but also all the strange and interesting cosines and relatives and composites that grow out of them. But she rapidly moved away from studying only that on which the turtle rests 
to also study all that which they carry, worlds of matter and meaning, and how they are intertwined with each other. And in that process, she took a lot of inspiration from, and in many ways, indeed radicalized, Nils Bohr's more philosophical writings on what it is like to explore the world through experiments and experiences. And thus, she kept insisting, like Bohr did, that the studies of physics and metaphysics do not exclude each other. They are really two sides of the same coin. They are really kind of entangled with each other. And if you go some of her key concepts, it's about interaction, it's about agential realism, and the claim coming again and again that, in a sense, you need to relate both to epistemology, that is, a theory of knowing, and ontology, that is, a theory of being, and ethics, that is, how are we to act in the world. And this deep sense of entanglement really goes through everything that she gives us. Now, when we asked her to present here, she, she said, yes, she would write us an abstract. And uh, after a weekend, we got the abstract. We had told her that we expected an audience not familiar with quantum physics or the entanglement theory. And what she came up with was this really beautiful notion of the troubling times undoing and remembering the future. And although we had said that it should be kind of easily accessible, you can say if you go through it, at first readings, it seems kind of really complex and intricate and implicated. The indeterminacy of time being at the core of quantum theory troubles the scalar distinction between the world of subatomic particles and social phenomena such as colonialism, capitalism, militarism, racism, nationalism, and environmental destruction. In other words, she says, we cannot just say that there is something that goes on at a low level and something else at a higher level. You cannot separate these scales. They are somehow interconnected, because all of it are entangled with nuclear and particle physics research. So, as she says, quantum physics is a very particular form of practice, a material discursive practice, which ties the military-industrial complex and gave birth to the atomic age, etc. And what she promised to do in this talk, then, is to take out quantum physics imminent deconstructive dynamics. In other words, what is it about that once you think at the level where no turtle seems to be resting on any turtle any longer, things dissolve into concepts that can be meaningfully applied at all other levels? How can you take that position to really trouble what, from modernity, you would think of stable notions of time, causality, etc.? And the final question that she promises to answer, we will see whether she gets here today, is that she might offer radical political imaginaries for what it is like to cohabit this planet more justly by undoing the future. And that seems to be an incredibly beautiful opening to what a future's lecture series might be about.